thank you everyone for um for coming back we've got a really interesting talk here from simon who's kindly flown up from is it adelaide yeah, Simon, yeah adelaide and um so I'm going to go into his background a bit more, but I understand his background in the military and aviation yeah. and yep. going to talk a bit about high performance and have done some stuff with MedStar, yep. um, who, you know, we were lucky to have involved in one of our previous education days. So I hope you just join me in uh, yeah, giving Simon a, a warm welcome. Thanks, guys. Thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. And also the for inviting me to talk about uh, human high performance. Uh, it's been an area I've been involved in for the last 20 years, both um, working in it and also researching it and uh, doing some stuff with the Air Force in human high performance. That's kind of my passion. Um, it's kind of my thing, it's my jam. So if you want to stop me, ask me questions, add some life experience that you have, some lived experiences, <clears throat> we'll just go on a journey of discovery. So choose your own adventure. I've got quite a few slides here. I talk about individual, team and organisation high performance. Um, so if anything's not hitting the spot or if something is hitting the spot and it resonates with you and you want to unpack it more, just stop there and let's have a chat about it. So jump in um, whenever you like. So I work with people very similar to you guys, so very highly technic technically skilled, uh, technical mastery, so uh, employing the right skill at the right time for the best outcome. Unfortunately, it's always under pressure, under stress, really low um, failure tolerance, um, and it's always time critical. It's a... Uh, this slide hurts me because my PhD has pretty much been broken into, th into three words. So performance equals potential minus interference. So your performance, obviously, outcome, patient outcome, how you feel as an operator. Um, into potential. So potential broken down to two things. So technical skills, how you intubate, do an RSI, you know, vascular access, through economy. Where non-technical skills is everything you guys do already. So communication, situational awareness, decision making. Um, it's all about harnessing those skills and also your clinical judgment or your SA. So when to use the right skill at the right time. But the problem is we have the interference part, and that is really when I see, and I've seen hundreds and hundreds of high, you know, high performance teams, individuals, interference is that real, real point where it hampers our performance and our performance outcome. So if I was to sort of talk to, talk about interference, um, probably the four main areas are uncertainty, time, impact, and then how that comes across as pressure. So uncertainty, you get up to a scene initially in the environment, there's a lot of environmental cues, there's a lot of stuff going on. So when you maybe go to a, to a trauma or even have a patient coming in, that level of uncertainty is quite high until you start to sort of make a bit of a picture and have a bit of a story to, to what's going on. So as uncertainty is quite high, your perceived amount of time is quite low. So, and I say perceived time, not actual time, so perceived time it feels really quite low and things feel really, you know, you have to do it straight away, straight away with really high technical mastery and, and non-technical skills as well. And because of those two, the impact of any decision we make seems really high. Uh, a good example of that is I always go to the um, serve yourself checkout at like Coles and Woolies, and I probably have too much groceries, so I just like to pack it myself. Um, so when you go there, so say you go and unpack your groceries and there's no, no one around, you can just chill out, do your thing, you know, pack your groceries, it's fine. But as soon as you have a lot of stuff there and you have a lot of people behind you and they're waiting and you're trying to unpack your stuff and then you're trying to scan and this stuff's not scanning, the perceived impact of doing that seems much higher. Like parallel parking your car and traffic around, the perceived impact of failing that seems a lot higher. And that increases your pressure. And then it comes back to the uncertainty again. Oh, no, I don't know if I'm going to park my car or I don't know if I'm going to pack that stuff fast enough. Now all of a sudden pressure starts to go up, impact starts to go up. So it's this really horrible loop of, um, of pressure building and building and building when we're trying to employ a technical and non-technical skill. The areas I really work in is that interference. Uh, when I want to work with uh, you know, athletes, doctors and, and pilots. So, so my background, um, uh, yes, in the Air Force for, for 20 years, on and off, so full-time, part-time, uh, in periods when I was at university. Uh, I've flown tactical transport aircraft, whereby I work with the Special Force community. So just after September 9-11, uh, we were training with those guys in high altitude, um, flying over in New Zealand to try and find the best ways to insert uh, Special Force operators and get their uh, Special Force operators out, whether it be landing, um, putting them out with parachutes over drop zones. We're trying to do a lot of different things in those environments, which is, you know, volatile, uncertain, chaotic and ambiguous. Exactly the same environment that you guys work in. Um, that was that, so I did that. I flew, uh, flew fighters, um, Hawk leading fighter, and then I became an instructor. Uh, and I was instructing, it'd be probably like, say you're, you know, you're a, you're a senior registrar currently you face some exams. That's kind of the area that I was instructing. So that's about the pilots. They had a lot of experience. 
Um, and we're trying to stream them to either become transport pilots or fighter pilots. And that's kind of the world I lived in there for 10, 10 years. In that training, we worked a lot with psychologists, uh, high performance coaches, obviously the, the flight instructors, trying to get the best out of individuals and teams. Uh, it's, it's very similar to, so my wife's a, an, an ED doctor. Uh, she's coming to her facing exams. Interestingly, she's coming to her facing exams and said, no, 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 I'm doing anesthetics now. So now yeah. she's, she's, <laughs> so now she's changing, changing specialties. So another five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So another five-year journey. Fantastic. Um, but but it's really interesting. So all our friends are doctors, and the identity that the doctors and, and paramedics and nurses have with their job. You talk about it outside work all the time, as you do inside work, and it's exactly the same in a flying squadron. You get a bunch of pilots together, and all they do is talk about flying. Similar with the sort of the critical care world. It seems like all you guys do is talk about your critical care. Oh, this person sucks to work with, or this patient was really hard, or it's a very similar world. Um, so my undergraduate and my postgraduate, uh, both in psychology and a PhD, which I'm still doing, is, uh, as it says there, naturalistic decision making and high performance. More specifically, I'm looking at uh, critical care doctors with MedStar. Um, so how does a senior consultant teach those skills of decision making, of clinical judgment to junior guys coming through? Um, and, and that's kind of where. So I initially started with fighter pilots. We're doing a lot of research with fighter pilots. But then what the Air Force wants and what academia wants are two totally different things, getting ethics, top secret clearance, too hard. So, so I'm going working with uh, quick care doctors, so just, just like you guys. Uh, I've done research uh, at Curtin University as well. Uh, I was a researcher under, the, under um, Professor Daniel Gucciardi, who's into resilience in, in teams, uh, military specifically, but also any environment where it was, you know, volatile and uncertain, exactly the same as your environment. So I've got a lot of work and I've got published works in psychology journals all about resilience and debriefing and, and briefing. Um, the HIPAA-NETS, the High Performance Research Network I work within, or I, I don't work within, but I'm, I'm, I'm a part of, and that's the, uh, the army has millions of dollars to put into people to make better people, to make better soldiers, then go and fight wars. So as opposed to focusing on patient outcomes, the military tend to focus on the, their individuals and their teams to make them the best they can be to then go and um, enact their, their skill set. Uh, so that's what frustrates me, especially, I mean, here, here at HEMS, there's a lot of focus on you guys, especially with your training. It seems like in a hospital, especially in a, in a tertiary trauma hospital, it's all about patient outcomes. There's no real time to do any courses like this. You know, uh, human factors courses, no time. So patient outcomes, ramping, we just need to get people through. You know, can't get people onto the ward. So I, I think it's a really fantastic, you know, position you guys are in. There's a bit more now focus um, to, to make you the best you can be for your patients. Um, so I also work with the Air Force. I consult with the Air Force in the RAF, oh, sorry, in the Air Force High Performance or Human Performance and Safety uh, Directorate. So I go around to all the Air Force bases and I have a look at what high performance programs are out there and offer ways they can enhance those programs. I'll say 90, 90, so Air Force is about 120 high performance programs. So spend millions of dollars on these programs. Um, a lot of them are really good after dinner speeches, but don't really give you the so what. This sounds really nice and we've got some really good skills, but how does, how does it work for me? How does that skill, how can I take that skill and use it in my environment. You know, is it, is it underpinned by psychological theory? Is it empirical evidence to say it works in this context? No, no. Um, but hey, I've done a lot of stuff and it seems like a good thing to give to the Air Force. So I go around and I do a review and, and try and enhance the human performance. I've got my own company called Core Performance um, and, and I do a lot of coaching with athletes, uh, doctors, um, you know, pilots, special force community. Uh, so I think I should do. So you guys know what non-technical skills are. So what I think would be a good sort of um, focus for today, if you guys are happy, is more how, because you're very senior, so how do you mentor this sort of stuff? How do you pick it up in your team members? How do you talk about it? Do you have a shared language for non-communication? Ah, uh, sorry, for, for non-technical non skills. Um, just reading off a few of those. So situational awareness, what does that look like? Um, these are umbrella terms for a whole bunch of behaviours, a whole sort of constellation of behaviours I need to enact to have, have one of these. So, you know, situational awareness. I went and saw MedStar, they did quite a lot of simulations and I offer advice on simulations. And what SA in one example or one simulation looks like is totally different to another one. So, for example, that nightclub scene, really loud music, really dark, lots of people in there. And so Dr. Paramedic crews in. Uh, and then the first thing I wanted to do was go and do a primary survey. So no, no sense safety or anything like that. Let's do, do, do a primary survey. So I did a primary survey and got the patient out. It's all good. But the one thing, and I didn't even notice it, I was watching, two of the nightclubbers, two of the clubbers had baseball bats literally standing over the critical care 
um, team, and that wasn't picked up at all. So that's scene safety. So that's situation awareness. It's something very different to another example, uh, retrieval. Uh, two doctors, sorry, doctor and a paramedic went in for a retrieval simulation, and they had a real GP there, and the real GP was acting like right in their face, right in the in, in the team's face, and they just let it happen. They just kept letting it happening, and you could just see that situation awareness was dropping off and dropping off and dropping off. So what was situational awareness look like there? Well, it probably looks like telling that that, uh, that rural GP or giving him some sort of role in the team that gets him away from the team. Hey, man, can you go and do something over here? So it looks different. What does it look like in the cockpit of an aeroplane? Heaps different as well. So that's the challenge. How do we teach non-technical skills when it's different um, depending on the situation? And you guys, we all do it. We all do these non-technical skills, but developing, developing language around it and knowledge that we're actually doing it and we're not just doing it unconsciously is quite a, quite a hard thing to do, especially for mentors as well. So I really like this diagram. In fact, this is actually from a medical journal. Um, so mine is asked the what teach the house. So as a flight instructor, a student comes to me, a really highly skilled pilot, and I ask them the what, what do they know? So what do they know in the textbook? What have they seen? What have they heard? What have, they, what have their friends told them? So that's my starting point. So for any any uh, any person I'm going to work with, I want to know the starting point. Then I kind of teach the how. What does it feel like? What does it sound like? What does it look like? What is the expectation? What are you going to go? Are you going to go out on a job with a helicopter or are you going to get in the cockpit with me? What's going to happen? How are you going to feel? So I try and explore that a little bit as well. What I'm really trying to do is reduce the interference. Because so your technical skills are really good. And because you drill your technical skills so much, the interference doesn't really affect them. So the more you drill your technical skill, the more it's not really interfered by. So I bet when you guys were doing your anesthetics rotation, you're probably in hundreds of tubes. So when you're on the roadside tubing, you're probably pretty good at that. Even if there's heaps of stuff going on, you're probably pretty good at tubing. In fact, I'll say your success rate is probably nearly 100% as well. Um, because the way we do it, we drill it. So we learn it, we go with the teacher. And, and, and we get there, we know what does it feel like, what does it sound like, what does it look like, what's the size, what's the rate, how do I, you know, how do I, I do this, how do I do that? And then you go and practice it. Um, something is like a thoracotomy, you want to get to practice that much, but tubing stuff you do all the time, you practice all the time, and you do it really, really well. But with non-technical skills, it's kind of by inference. It's kind of, oh, yeah, let's talk about communication, let's talk about teamwork or, or leadership. It's always in a small context and always tends to be from one person's perspective as well. So that sort of, oh, this is what I do, so this is what you should do really confuses the, the water as well. So, so what I really, really am trying to get at is what we need to do is control that interference. As mentors, we need to say, this is what we're going to expect, and we need to try and get rid of a lot of the noise. So people can then slowly learn these techniques and know when to, so just like a technical skill, a non-technical skill is using clinical judgment, when to use the right skill at the right time for the right outcome. Um, speaking of, I don't know if you guys know David Cooksley, he uh, runs Life Flight, Flight, the, the, the Brisbane-based, um, Retrieval medicine. So Dave, Dave's really big into, into non-technical skills. You know, this is a good trauma, is a quiet trauma. There's not heaps and heaps and heaps of talking. We've got a good shared mental model and we've got goal-directed behaviour. We're not all trying to talk. We're, you know, we're very much the leader is controlling the group and we're, you know, we're doing five-minute sort of rounds. So in five minutes, you might want to do primary survey. You might want to get some OBS and get some vascular access. Boom. Not much more talking needs to happen from that point onwards. So that's communication, but that's the communication in the other, other kind of realm where it's quieter but a very directed, uh, goal-directed behaviour. Uh, and, and once again, all we're trying to do is reduce that interference so we can use those skills. And we can also be aware that, you know what, I'm starting to talk a lot or I've, I haven't shared my mental model and all of a sudden the paramedic now doesn't know what I'm trying to do because I want to draw some different drugs, I want to do something else. So sometimes you need to talk more, sometimes you need to talk less. So as a mentor, you really need to debrief, not just the technical skills, but all those non-technical skills as well. Just going back a slide, I really like this because over 20 years, this is pretty much all the non-technical skills there are. That, that's pretty much all the umbrella terms. So if you want to talk about something, it's probably going to fall into, in, into one of those categories. So when you go and do a, simula a simulation, especially when I was the med star, I said, hey, how are you trying to assess two of those? Just pick two of them. Pick two of them. Talk to the trainee. Um, <laughs> we're going to look at these skills. And because now, now we're going to look at them, now that's something we can hopefully start to drill. OK, we're going to look at, I don't know, decision making uh, and self-awareness. And they start to drill those skills. Here's an example. Um, <laughs> so, what students hate doing in the aeroplane is flying at another aeroplane straight. It's just horrible. It's a really horrible feeling. So, say we take four aeroplanes. So, we take, yeah, four aeroplanes. And we're going to teach a student basic fighter manoeuvring. So, in basic fighter manoeuvring, 
Um, the person in the front, so the person at the back's at the advantage because the person at the back can fire a weapon to hit the person at the front. And all this person at the front has to do is do something and get behind because now he can or she can now get the weapons shot off. That's, simply, that's all we're doing. So we go into the area in a close formation, something like this, because it's easier to have aeroplanes close together as a leader. We then go into the area, we'll then break the formation apart, we'll do our basic fire and manoeuvring. But at some point, normally when we're really low on fuel, we have to join back up as a close formation. And because we're always really low on fuel, the way we do that, we pretty much fly toward each other. Um, there's a whole heap of technical skills we use there. We fly toward each other, so we've got the highest and fastest closure rate. And then all I want to say, this is me, this is my lead. All I want to do is basically, he'll turn toward me, and I just want to come in like that. Really dynamic, really awkward, and it's really, uh, even, even when you're very experienced at it, it can get really bad really fast, because we're effectively setting a collision course. Um, so there's a whole heap of technical skills we use. There's a whole heap of non-technical skills which underpin me using these technical skills. I'll give you two main ones. So focus of attention. Uh, there's three things I want to focus on. And when I talk to the trainees or, or when I try and teach things, I only tell them more than three things. Because you can't attend to more than three things. It's just too much information coming at you really fast. So height. So when we do it, we have a small, we have basically your thumb, you know, your thumbnail size. You want to maintain the thumbnail size of sky between that aeroplane lead and the horizon. You just want to keep that as you're coming closer and closer to the aeroplane. So height. Line, you want to stay on a rejoin line. So when he's turning, there's a line that you fly on, so you fly on one effect of the collision course and speed. You want to control that speed. So that's three things. That's three things, but that's a non-technical skill. So now what I have, it works like height line speed. So when that student is flying, I'm going to do taking a height line of speed, doing something height, looking at height, looking at line, looking at speed. So Effectively, what we're doing, we're drilling a non-technical skill. So I found a non-technical skill, I found a work cycle for a non-technical skill, and I've got prioritisation. Height's first, so height's always at the start of it, line second, speed third. So now we can drill that, so when we come back and we debrief or I talk to the, the guy in the cockpit, we can talk about it. Now we have a shared language for a non-technical skill um, with a work cycle. And what that does, it sets up the next three. This is some confidence, some sort of self-efficacy. Okay, now I can actually control what I'm doing. Um, Self-talk, it's really easy to get inside your head and go, this is really hard, I'm really stressed out, and I'm going to have really maladaptive behaviour because I don't want to be here. But by getting someone out of their head, and the easiest way to get someone out of their head is by getting them to actually say what they are doing. So I might see. Thus saying that they have not got the capacity to then get inside their head and go, I can't do this because they are verbalising what they're doing. Um, and stress management, which kind of goes, goes part and parcel with those two. So now what's happening, now my situational awareness is getting bigger. As we test this student that's getting a feel for it, they can think, okay, when I hit the rejoin and do a whole bunch of checks, we're now going to be descending into the airfield, so we do a whole other bunch of checks, and I've got to make sure. Um, so what we do visual inspections on lead as well, because we've done this basic flight of manoeuvring. Uh, so now I can start to think ahead of the game. Heightline speed, okay, I'm now in there, but now I'm, I'm primed for the next event, which is a non-technical skill. And communication. Um, whenever someone gets maxed out, communication drops off straight away. It's the first thing that goes, hearing and then talking. And as an instructor in the back or as a mentor with you guys, when you're working with, with others, you might see that people get really, really quiet or, or start to talk heaps and heaps and heaps, and nothing's happening, but the wheels are turning, you're not going anywhere. So that's a really good sign that, hey, either I need to step in here because the learning point has gone, or it's starting to get traction, they're starting to sort of get where they want to get this really good learning point, which we'll debrief afterwards. So as a mentor, uh, and, and I work with a lot of other people, not just pilots, and, and I watch what they do. So, so like with, uh, with uh, retrieval medicine, watching the simulation. I stand back and I think, at what point is learning point gone? So when we debrief, so when we do a group debrief after this 20 minute simulation, are they gonna actually recall what they've done or is it gonna be new information coming to them? Um, and don't be afraid, I mean, I'm not sure how you run your simulations, but don't be afraid to stop a simulation. Because you only have a number, very, very small number of simulations. So it depends on what philosophy is. Is the philosophy is to get them to go to a logical conclusion? Where does actually teach and learn in, in, in a safe environment, a psychological safe environment? So I think the expectation needs to be set that, hey, yeah, we, we may stop this along the way, we want to unpack and talk about things, always want to run it to a logical conclusion, and then we'll talk about it afterwards. So I think there's some, uh, yeah, some, some philosophical points about simulation, but about getting the best training for the person. And the worst thing you want them to do is walk away with no confidence. Even if technical skills weren't that great, if I can get someone walking away with confidence and engagement, that's the 99%. That's a hard bit. I can teach technical skills. You guys can teach technical skills. We're really good at it. It's in the book. We know how to do it and we can we can drill it. But you need to also be able to teach, you know, self-efficacy, um, motivation. Not teach it, but you need to be able to elicit that. And I think that's the hardest thing. So 
so that's a non-technical skill. The next part of that equation was uncertainty. Oh, sorry, it wasn't uncertainty, it was interference. So a lot of students would come to what pilots would come to me and they put on a face, they put on an act, they, they feel they look confident, you know, they want to come across as confident, but they inside they aren't confident, they're really worried about what's going to happen. Because in aviation, it kind of sucks because if you fail a flight, historically, you know, you get remediation, you do a couple of flights, and then you go and do the retest. And what tends to happen is, hey, they've probably got really good technical skills, but they just cannot ever get back onto the horse. They just think, you know what, my friends aren't failing. How come I'm failing? And then, because we have really high failure rates as well, we used to have really high failure rates before we did a lot of non-technical skill training. So when this starts to happen, it gets really hard. So we really try and set expectation before that first flight. And the first, I like, I like the three Ps, so pressure. You know, like you guys, all in a really high pressure environment. We're going to have a sympathetic response or a yeah, sympathetic response to it. It's just how it is. It's normalising to that and not having a maladaptive behaviour and being honest about that as well. So we find with um, aviation and with, 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 uh, with squad flying squadrons, as people will go, will just gravitate to certain people to talk to, you know, about things. And we just stand back and watch that. We watch who people go to and then we upskill those people. We upskill those people in how do you have open, you know, how do you have open conversations with open end of questioning? You know, positive affirmation, reflection, summarising, all that good psychological kind of safety. How do you have those um, have those conversations? We upskill people. With, we upskill those people who whose students gravitate toward. Um, so perseverance, perseverance. So with this rejoin, we might do it five times, might do it ten times to practice, depending on our fuel levels. But sometimes we we'll go on a mission because Air Force have unlimited amounts of money. It's about twenty thousand dollars an hour, but hey, if this person isn't getting rejoins, we'll literally go up there and take two aeroplanes, about forty thousand dollars an hour, and we'll just do rejoins constantly, constantly, constantly do rejoins and drill it. The advantage we have it may may not be reflected um, in this environment, uh, but we really want to get that self-efficacy. We want to get that engagement, and I really want that person to go there and know, you know what, in really bad weather, when I'm really low on fuel, I'm really fatigued. And it's a really volatile environment. I can do this. I can do this day. I can do this night. I can do this anytime. So really try and build that, uh, build that, um, you know, self-efficacy in the student. Uh, perseverance habit. So initially, our behaviour is driven by motivation. I'm guaranteed you come to work get no motivation. So what I want that to happen. That's fine. You know, it's just a bad day. But I want habit patterns to then drive behaviour. Because if we don't have habit patterns and we have poor motivation outcome's not going to be great as well. So we need to make sure people have adaptive behaviour to high-stress environments. Whatever that looks like for you, whatever it looks like for flying or for sport um, or for, you know, special force community, we make sure we keep these adaptive behaviours and we and we can pick when they aren't adaptive and we can talk about them openly and we can have a learning and we can have some sort of um, rectification. Um, process, just believe in the process. You're not going to be perfect first time, you know. I imagine when you guys, when you did your first job, it was just like full on. There's so much information coming out hard and fast. And you know, how is your communication? How is your situation awareness? I mean, obviously you would have had a good outcome, but how did you feel doing it? So we, the setting the expectation is this process is going to suck. There's going to be some really good times. There's going to be some really bad times. But out of this, I want to make sure out of the end of the day, you walk away with confidence, but you know what you've done right and what you've done wrong and how you're going to fix it. Uh, acknowledge feelings. This one here, you wouldn't think you'd use it. It's for special force community, talk about knowledge feelings all the time. That's a really psych, even though they're like effectively trained killers, they literally talk about psychological safety and they talk about acknowledging feelings all the time. So if you've got a small knit team, so you know, you are a doctor paramedic and then maybe, you know, a paramedics on the site and maybe some coppers, you might have six people and you have really small teams. Um, you don't, you're not like in a tertiary hospital anymore. It's really, really important to acknowledge it. So when a student comes in, I'll just use his rejoin and, and, it, and you know, it just, it becomes really dangerous. And, oh, it's getting really I'll take over. Hey man, how'd that feel? And normally it's a swear word. Oh, fuck. Oh, shit. And that's that's good. That's fine. That's totally fine. So I want that. I want that to come out. And then and then we go through the expectation. Hey, this is pretty hard. Hey, yeah, man, it's pretty hard. How are you feeling? Ah, oh, you know, I don't think I can do it. Okay, you tell me what two things you can do now to make that better. And what it always comes down to. What what I want them to tell me. Oh, I needed to focus attention. I need to do that high line speed work. So I was like, fuck yeah, high line speed. Do the work cycle, man. And then you do it again, and all of a sudden, oh, okay, now I'm not really thinking about this myself, and I'm feeling I'm not feeling frustrated anymore because I'm now falling back to this drilled procedure of you know of a non-technical skill. So the two things I do, and two things you guys can do, is direction of attention and direction of action. So I've taken over with the aeroplane. Hey man, how are you feeling? I've acknowledged hard, you know. Try to, and I used to do it a lot. Try to say, yeah, when I was doing it, it felt hard for me because I don't care about you. So don't say, don't say, oh yeah, for me I do this. Don't care about that. 
don't take over, hey man, how are you feeling? Yeah, it's really hard. That's cool, dude, that's cool. So what are you going to do next time to fix yourself up and get them immediately out of the head, get them outside of the head to thinking about data points, not emotional points, but data points, environmental data points. So I'll normally do two direction of attentions and two direction of actions. Um, so direction of attention will be a non-technical skill. Hey, I want you to focus on this and I want you to focus on this. So I want you to look at the aeroplane uh, and I want you to prioritise your scan cycles. That's a non-technical skill. And how are you going to do it? So I say, what's the work cycle, man? Right line speed. Awesome. Go ahead, go and do it. And the most important thing to shut up, just don't say anything because I'm working really hard. Um, and, and when you are mentors and, and or, you know, you, you're watching people work and you're offering advice, make sure it's the right time, you know, because that's the last thing you want is someone else giving you new information coming in here and you're trying to do a technical skill or try to run a team. So, and even when you're running teams as well, I see, so I mentor a lot of leaders and junior leaders and what they really want to do is they want to control everyone. As opposed to setting a joint goal, which we're now all going to work, work toward because we've all got role articulation, they want to control that person, they want to control that person, the airway doctor, I want you to do this, I want you to do this. As opposed to, hey, in the next five minutes, I want to do three things, I want to do, you know, promise survey, vascular access, and ops. All right, sweet, sweet, so, because now they're going to be doing this stuff. Um, so that's what I say, junior, junior leaders, uh, I'm not saying you guys are junior at all, but in the Air Force, just talking way too, or instruction talking way too much when they're working pretty hard as it is. Um, yeah, so practice doesn't equal perfect. So if you see someone, and we see it all the time, decision making is okay, communication is okay, and we do a simulation, and we don't really focus too much on it, I think that's a disservice because perfect practice equals perfect. So if someone, especially in a simulation environment, isn't quite doing something, you know, that's, that's okay, they'll eventually get it. Well, they might, they might, they might keep doing that thing, and it might become maladaptive in the actual environment. So anything with non-technical skills, pick people up on it. You know, phraseology is really important, but you need to develop language around it. What does it look like? What does it feel like? What does it feel like to them? Now, how can they correct as well? So it's pretty much stop, correct, continue. That's, that's, that's what I think, um, and that's kind of, kind of what I do. Um, the expectation I've set when I'm flying with someone or I'm working with someone is really quite abrupt because I don't have time because I really want all my um, uh, my phraseology to be goal-directed. I don't want to say, hey, man, this is going to make you feel a bit uncomfortable. We're not going to do any of that. When we're doing the job, when we're doing a simulation, I'm going to say, this is where you are now, this is where you're going to get to, and this is how you're going to get there. So I sort of take them through a linear process. Um, I see a lot of simulations, a lot, with uh, with a doctor going, hey, to the paramedic, hey, look, I'm really busy, I'm really sorry, can you store up some, you know, I don't know, some rocky uranium or some ketamine? But you know, you're saying, sorry, so hey, I need you to do this, what we're going to do is this. So, so, so maybe you want to set the expectation at the start, maybe you've got a really good relationship, you don't have to, but don't feel like you need to, uh, I want you to do the word befriend, but just think you want goal-directed behaviour. Boom, 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 boom. That's what you want. And then you can talk about it afterwards or you can talk about it before. Um, but that's one thing I see. So, so we have heads-up display. So when we get back from a debrief, everything's recorded. And so as a senior instructor, I'll actually watch junior instructors uh, instruct. And they'll always say, oh, I'm really sorry, man. Well, hey, look, uh, that's not really that good. And they'll sort of talk wishy-washy. But I want to know what the problem is. I want to know what the cause is. And I want to know what the fix is. Bang, bang, bang. You know, afterwards, we're going to have coffee and talk about it. But when, it, when we're in the heat of the heat of the battle, I want a problem cause fix analysis really fast. Yep. Sorry to interrupt you. No, no, please, anytime. One of the things that we find very difficult, I think, as an organisation that I think probably MedStar does as well, is that that, that style of communication you're describing where you're very efficient and using good phraseology yep. is, works well within our team. But when we're, we're in an environment with flash teams or people we don't know or road ambulance crews or other people that yeah. are slightly new to sometimes of us being there, that can sometimes have the counter effect of pissing everyone off. Mm. <laughs> how, how, how do you incorporate that into the environment in which you do leadership training? Or, yeah. or is there an analogous situation in your background that... So that, that flash mob mentality, flash mob mentality. So, yeah, spot on. Or you might be... Uh, running a trauma and the trauma surgeon comes down. So now you've got more people coming into your team, right? You haven't, you haven't set expectations. You're probably not going to debrief with them either. So, so what are you going to do there? So I think role, role articulation is really important. Go in there and set the roles. So this is where we are now. This is where we're going to get. So this is my shared mental model. This is how I'm going to get there. These are my roles and these are priorities. So I will give um, that trauma surgeon, I want you to do blah, blah, blah. These are my priorities because you're running it. So you go into that job. Um, so, you know, yourself and, and a doctor will go in and then all of a sudden the paramedics work on the patient probably stop, oh, hems are here, hey, we don't have to do anything anymore. So you need, you need to run it, you need to be really not aggressive, but you need to be very forthright with, okay, 
I'm just going to stand back. I want to get the picture with what's going on. Someone will come and brief you on it and be very directive. Give roles and give direction as opposed to letting people to kind of talk and do all that. You might want to do a huddle. You might want to, you know, snap everyone in. You might just want to, you know, just quieten the scene down. But being, being directive, um, that's probably the biggest one. And, and people are mature enough to go, I, need, I just need to shut up now. I mean, some people won't. But I think that, that direction, uh, it's probably really hard when you hit, hit the scene. You're not really sure what's going on. They've been there for an hour trying to extricate someone or try, try and do whatever. So I think initially going soft and just see what's going on, stand back and go, OK, you know, scene, scene safety, survey, all that sort of stuff. I want to do a primary survey at some point. I want to see what everyone else is doing as well. So people need three things, really. They need autonomy. They need to feel, that, you know, they've got some sort of locus of control. Um, they need to have, obviously, ability as well. Uh, and they need to feel like belonging. So if, if you have a team and you have a flash mob, <laughs> they want some sort of belonging in that team. So you can't say, oh, just, just fuck off. You need to give them a role. So that example I gave with the, uh, with the GP, that um, the rural GP was in, in that sort of doctor's face. You need to give them a role. You need to give them some belonging in the team, some sort of autonomy as well, and feel that you know they've actually got a skill to utilise. So I think, yeah, I think giving role and, and, and I think um, giving priorities is really important. Just a long-winded way to answer your question, that kind of. Yeah. Yeah. It's a real challenge, and it's almost like the next level, I think, above some of the stuff that we're talking about now is mm. the ability to be able to be directive when you need to be, but also the, the ability to be able to be flowery when you need to be as well. Totally. To your advantage. Yep. And, 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 and what I'm really interested in, how you try and guide people to know the difference between to do Based it. Based on personalities. Because it's fucking hard. Mm. It really is stuff. You know, with, with well-drilled teams, you can get very efficient stuff done often with just looking at each other. Mm. But, but the next level, I think, on top of that sometimes is the environment which we often place is people that don't want you to be there or dealing with people that are underperforming or, or stressed around you. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Encapsulate part of that. Yeah, so so that that yeah that, that situation is very personality dependent as well. So the interaction of of, of the leader there with someone sort of stressing out or very uh, adversarial as well. So how do you normally deal with patients? How, how do you normally do it? You're going you're, you're going to revert back to your who you truly are. So there is no one answer to that because some people will be yeah exactly like you said they'll be quite um, receptive to someone's emotion. And if they've got more experience, they'll have more capacity too. So they'll be able to do their technical skills, non-technical skills, and have capacity to also take that person on the journey to make sure they aren't, you know, you, that patient or that patient's partner might be fucking maxed out, so, you know, stressed right out. And you can't go in there and just go, rah, A, B, C, D, E. It's not going to work. Some personalities won't be able to do too, though. Some, some will be junior, won't have a personality to do that. Just how it is. So, so that's going to be a hard so that situation will never resolve. Some will be senior and have a really lovely personality, you know. They'll be focused. I know what they're doing. Really high technical skill to also have that emotional intelligence to go, hey, look, what we're going to do with your husband? We're going to we're going to do this, and it's really important you do this because you know whatever the reason is, we're going to, we're going to look after him. We're going to make sure he gets to you know hospital safely. So it's personality based. Unfortunately, we there is no one answer for everyone. Some people just can't do it. Some people are really good at it and really shit technical skills. Um, but some people are awesome. And when you find that person that's awesome, you make sure they're an exemplar for everyone else. And when I say don't put them on a pedestal. What you tend to find is their values and beliefs will be aligned with the values and beliefs of the organisation and also of the team as well. So when you're trying to find mentors, hey, like the like question you had, find someone that you know that does that and say, how do you do that? Like, you know, I'm just so maxed out. I've got other people on the team who are a flash. I don't even know who the hell they are. They're just maxing out. But mum and dad, I've got the, you know, this baby girl down here. How do I do it? So learning from people that do it, I think is really, really important. Uh, shadowing them if you can and using them as a mentor. But it's personality based, unfortunately. I mean, you can train a psychopath to have, you know, understand emotions, but they won't be able to live that experience. So you still can train yourself for it, but I think you need to do the basics well. Be able to do your technical skills really well, be able to control a team really well, control uncertainty really well. And now you have capacity to take everyone else on the journey and manage other people. Um, but do the basics well before we start to look at that high stuff. Does that kind of yeah. come around to them? I won't go through that when we're out of time, otherwise. Um, I'll touch on it. So decision making. Um, this is my PhD. I love it. I could talk like literally all day about this. Because it's... <laughs> all it simply is, is I'm going to go into an environment. I'm going to get a whole lot of environmental cues, and I'm going to do pattern recognition. So I've got long-term memory, clinical judgment, and I'm going to match those environmental cues to the closest exemplar or prototype in my long-term memory. I'm going to put it into my executive function, so my prefrontal cortex. I'm going to put it into my executive function, and I'm going to predict an outcome. So the person that's more senior has more lived experience, has more long-term memory, has more of those prototypes, they can, they can do pat, pat, pattern recognition really, really fast. 
And now they've got more space for everything else. So they can, you know, do flash mobs, they can run teams, and they can do it. So the real trick for you guys is how do you teach your experience to someone who's more junior? And that's what I really struggle with, um, trying to teach others and, and try and do it myself. So first of all, I think that expectation that when we go into a scene that's a bit chaotic, we're going to get that sympathetic response. It kind of sucks. The amygdala is going to tell the hypothalamus, hey, you need to release some information down the nerve tracks to start releasing your um, uh, adrenaline. Start releasing adrenaline, you know, start to get the blood pumping and start to get the sweating happening. That's always going to happen. So that's always going to happen. So we need to have that as an expectation because if, if you think this is not going to happen to me, I'm pretty good at this, and all of a sudden that happens, the worst time to then realise that is doing the job. So when I talk and when I mentor other people, and especially other, other senior people, how does it feel? How does it sound? For me, I'll get a taste as well. And so we, so we talk through that. And when we talk through that, we now talk through that in the context of actually doing something quite hard, like a technical skill. So what's the language around that? Um, so I really want to talk about that. The problem is, so we'll have that sympathetic response. You know, we're, we're releasing all this adrenaline in our body. Uh, so noradrenaline, epinephrine, norepinephrine, we're, we're releasing. And that's cool up until the point where the HPA, HPA axis kick in. So the hypothalamus releases a, a hormone to the pituitary gland that releases ACTH. It's the, uh, it's the, um, the adrenal gland now releasing cortisol. And that's still okay. You know, we're getting glucose into the blood. Um, we're starting to get that sort of that higher blood pressure starting to happen. And that's still good because that's over the long period of time. And now I can be hyper focused, hyper vigilant because the body is ready. But if we go into this situation and we find it as a threat, it's like, and a threat is I don't have the skills to be able to do this, I don't have the perceived skills to be able to go into this really full on trauma or, or whatever it is you'll keep punching out this cortisol. And the thing with cortisol, it sucks. It's really good to start with, and it has this thing called a uh, quadratic relationship with the executive function. And what that means is the, so when we're trying to work you know, with long-term memory, we get information coming in, and we use the executive function, which is in our prefrontal cortex. We're using that to basically synthesize, what we, synthesize our prediction. So what cortisol does is it actually stops that um, blood perfusion into the prefrontal cortex. It's really good, really good, and then all of a sudden it stops that perfusion and just slows it down. And now we find we can't retrieve information. It's like, oh, I've done the problem problem survey. Uh, what's next? Because it's now a threat to us. And now this threat kind of sucks because now it's a threat. Now the unknown, you know, the unknown starts to go up. I'm not really sure what's going on. The pressure, time starts to hit up. Sorry, sorry, time, perceived time starts to drop down. And now it gets really, really hard. So non-technical skills are really cool until we don't have them anymore. Now what do we do? So one thing that works, if people talk about controlled breathing or that combat breathing, it doesn't work for me. You know, four seconds in, four seconds hold, four seconds out. I don't know, it's, I, it doesn't work for me. It doesn't work for some, some people, it works really well. For me, it doesn't work. That's 12 seconds. That's 12 seconds I can do something. I can, I can either think about something, I can do a physical action. So we call it a physiological release. And when you're flying, when you're pulling lots of G as well, so we have to wear a thing called a G suit, and it really sucks because it's like a pair of um, pants, and it comes around your abdomen as well. And the whole idea is when you pull G, it punches air into that so you can push against it so you can keep the blood into those vital organs, so into your brain, into your heart. Um, so the stress always comes in the heavy G. We're trying to find someone to, to do stuff with, and we can't do that for four seconds in. You just can't do it because you can pretty much can't breathe. So what we try and do is a physiological release, and that is a like a, just a breath coming out and then a keyword. to it can be anything. And what we try and do prior to this all happening is set that keyword up. Something's happened really well. So, um, so say I'm training someone to do basic body delivery, or I'm training someone how to intubate, I'm training someone, whatever it is. When it goes well, I'll keyword that. Could be anything. Could be anything. Anything like, uh, fuck yeah, or anything, anything. Uh, I'll get someone that's quite embarrassing on a certain line art, uh, and we keyword it, okay? So, what that means, and that that is now associated with something, oh, I've got, I can do it. I'm confident, I've got self efficacy, I, I can do it. So, now we go in the same situation. We're going to get a sympathetic response. Now it's going to really kick off. We're going to shoot those cortisol coming, pumping out, and now it's a threat. But that's really bad because now I can't retrieve that long-term memory. We do a physiological response. So I breathe out and I say that word. I say, and as soon as I say that word, it leads to an action. And that action is a work cycle. It doesn't matter what it is. You're doing your primary survey. You're getting to the end of it. You know what's going on. Fuck. I'm going to start again. A, B, C, D. Or it might be, okay, I'm going to try and do this. But we need to stop that cycle because otherwise you get inside your head. And if you get inside your head, kind of fucked because then it gets worse and worse and worse and you just can't do anything and then everything gets out of control. So physiological release, the literature says that's probably the best thing you can do. You get the breathing. The only way you can control your physiological response is, is that breathing. Um, so, yeah, if it works for you, keep doing it. 
teach other people because it does show it does work. But you get 12 seconds to do something. So think about something. Think about, okay, that keyword and think about what you're then going to do. What is my goal-directed behaviour for the next five minutes? Even if you're not sure, just do something. Because if you do something, then more information will flow. You'll be acting with that environment. And then, oh, oh now I kind of know what to do. So, so that kind of stops that floundering. We kind of can keep moving forward. Um, make an early decision. So what I see a lot of people do, I'll give you an example like this. Is not making a decision. They want heaps of information. It's almost like a comfort blanket. I don't want to make a decision on three bits. I want 20 bits of information because they're procrastinating at making a decision. But what you find is if you make really small decisions really fast, or not really fast, but really small decisions based on two or three bits of information, it might be ambiguous and it might be almost contradictory, but you're now going to start to find a way forward. Okay, now I've got three more bits of information. Okay, now I'm going to refine what I'm doing. What's really important there, if you decide to go and do, I don't know, do a rapid sequence induction or you want to do something, Make sure you are reflecting on, okay, is this the right thing to do? Is this the right thing to do? Because it's really, really easy then to go, I'm going to use this work cycle. I'm only going to attend to information that confirms this, but not, not that it says I probably shouldn't do it. So make sure you are going through whatever work cycle it is and then coming back to the start and doing it again. Because as you're working, time's progressing and more information is coming and you make better decisions. So just do something. Um, I like this. This is from a paper I reviewed the other day. Um, this is making an uncertainty. I'll change around a little bit. So accept uncertainty as the norm and making decisions on small amounts of information. Don't expect to have lots of information to have time. You know, you're not a, I don't know, you're not a GP sitting back and you can now, or you're not a tertiary hospital. You're now actually out there doing stuff, sitting the information and make decisions. And as mentors, you normalise that to your trainees as well. Um, and if you are making decisions on small amounts of information, you need to keep updating that. Um, and not have an anchoring bias, really, really important. An open mind won't always help. Yeah, we always say stand back and open mind and kind of see what's going on. Yeah, do that, but don't get to the point where you've got too much information, now you can't make a decision. So, so focus in on what you want to do, start doing it and refine. Um, what are some main things I haven't really spoken about? Fixation trap, yeah, so, so don't get fixated. So what you want to do is like a null hypothesis. You want to be trying to, so you're doing something, you, you know, you're doing a protocol, uh, you're doing an algorithm. What you're also doing is not getting information that also confirms that, but also stuff that doesn't seem right. Because if you get a few abnormalities, then probably what you're doing may need to be adjusted or you may need to change. So don't just look for information that says, yes, this is what I should be doing. Look for information that says, this is what I shouldn't be doing, or maybe I should be doing something different. Um, asking your team as well. So with that flash mob, hey, any, any points or anything else I should be considering? And, and when I talk to a flash mob, I, you, know, you don't know their names, I always point to people. So if you say anything I should be doing in a group, no one will say anything, but you point to people, then either, you know, they'll, they'll almost be empowered to say something if they feel that's appropriate as well. So using that communication and, and being not an aggressive, being assertive, assertive as well. Um, sometimes you'll have to act on the environment to get the answer out you want. You can't just stand back. You need to get in there and start doing stuff because it's what give you the answer that you want. So when you're mentoring uh, and, and when you're doing simulation, yeah, there's times where you do need to stand back and see what's going on, but there's times you need to interact with that environment and get those answers or, or get those data points out that you need. Uh, and and as, as experts, try and think of ways you can teach juniors to do this. Like, what do you do? What actually do you do? So, for example, um, when a senior doctor is doing a pickup, so doing a retrieval, when they walk through the hospital, I just, and this is this, I didn't realise this, I look where, where, where the good points to get out of the hospital are. They'll have a look at people's name tags. Who's a locum? Who's a nurse? Who's a doctor? Who's, who works in this hospital? Who's, yeah, who's just a locum? They probably won't know where some of the products are. Where am I going to stand? Who am I going to talk to? So all this stuff they take in. I go, do you tell other people this? I don't know. It's just this way to do it. like when you're mentoring, these small things you do unconsciously, and when you reflect on them, you know, with a coach or, or someone else, um, it's probably really good to do it because you do it all the time unconsciously. So to think about that and to talk about that, and all of a sudden they start saying stuff, oh, yeah, I should do that, and I'll do that. How do you choose that as well? Because that's stuff that you just do, but it builds up that clinical judgment. So that self-reflection, before you go and talk to someone, before you go and run a simulation, think about what you actually do. And unfortunately, all this stuff is unconscious. You do it so many times, it's an unconscious competence. That's why it's really good to get two senior people to talk together, some jump some ideas, do a bit of a tabletop exercise. A lot of stuff will come out of that. Oh, this is some good information. And didn't realise I was doing, but I'll push it on to the junior staff. And it may be a massive thing for them. Oh, this is, well, this makes things heaps easier. So do reflect on your own practice as well. 
Sorry, I was just curious about storytelling in that. Um... Oh, yeah, so storytelling. So what we like to do, um, it's like when you dream, you have like random neuro, uh, neurons firing off. And so the brain likes to make things coherent and linear, just that's what it does. So when you go in there and you've got a few data points, well, you need to tell yourself a story about that because otherwise you'll these three data points and how they're linked. Um, so it might be, I don't know, there's the doctors over here, sorry, there's the paramedics over here, the, the fires are over here, and then there's a car turned upside down there. So just tell yourself a story to start with. So already we're saying to link up data points in a coherent linear approach. It may not be linear, but don't have just random data points because you'll just forget about it. If you link them up to a story, okay, this car's obviously coming through here, Poppers are here, Ambos are here doing stuff. At least you kind of got a bit of an idea. Now when people come to talk to you, as opposed to new information, you're basically assimilating that information into your story. So you're just refining that story. So you've always got a story, so you've got a starting point and a kind of an end point. You want to get them out, you want to extricate them in a certain amount of time. And all you're doing now when you get information and the way you uh, remember information and you retrieve information is from a storyboard. Um, that's why when people go for exams, uh, especially like um, doing the OSCE exam, you need to have a bit of a story because otherwise it's very hard to get information out. Um, so people might have an acronym or they might have, you know, might remember a process by, you know, a funny sort of, you know, funny story. So stories are really good to start to tell yourself a story and then start filling those gaps. And might need to change the story, might need to amend it, but at least you have some sort of starting point before you've spoken to anyone. So this is my kind of environment for, for many years. Um, that's the same airplane, obviously two, two different shots. So what we do, this is really hard. So this is, this is when lots of information, just like you guys have, is coming in at once. So we do a thing called a high-low time on target nav. And what that is, you might take one airplane, you might take four airplanes, um, get airborne and fly really high to save fuel for a certain amount of time, and then we'll get to a turn point, and then we'll come down low level, we'll split the formation apart. Well, that's be a single airplane, that's cool as well. And then we uh, take all this instrumentation away. We give them a clock and a map. That's all they've got. So they're flying at 500 kilometres an hour, 100 metres off the ground, and they've got like five or six turn points to hit um, and hit the target within plus or minus 15 seconds. To make it even harder, we have two aeroplanes or we have four aeroplanes, so we'll split them off. So you then have to ID the aeroplanes coming into the target. We do a whole heap of stuff. So it's really, it's really full on. It's really, really full on. So it's full on for the instructor and it's full on for the student especially because we're taking all this augmentation away. We've just got a map and I've got a clock. Um, so we start pretty high. So we start in our formation. We cruise on up to 20 or 30,000 feet, do stuff. And there's this really procedural based high level. It's very procedural based. And then we come on down and then we descend and now we're into our low level. Now the problem is on a map, maps are always from a top looking down. So yeah, so the student can prepare for it. Yeah, I kind of got a good idea. As soon as you're flying like that, it doesn't look at all like the map. It's it just, everything looks really good. It's really easy because you've got the ocean and land, so it's quite easy to find turn points. When you're doing this in the mountains or in the hills, everything looks the same. You're really low, so you have no anticipation either. So if you miss a turn point, life gets really, really hard. So there's a lot of technical skills and we drill them. So when I take students through this scenario, I never or I very rarely debrief them on technical skills. They're pretty good at flying the aeroplane, they're pretty good at holding speed, they're pretty good at holding heading, and they're pretty good at formation at this stage as well. They all have issues with non-technical skills. Uh, Prioritisation, uh, decision-making uh, on limited bits of information. So I'll just go through it really quick to try and tie, tie it up a little bit. So prioritisation, this is what tends to happen. So you'd be really high up, you'd be in cloud. So it's already it's really hard. We come, we start the set descending down. You try and do formation communication, formation procedures, heaps of stuff. And you're trying to think, think ahead as far as you can and you're in cloud all the way down. So you went to a lower safe height, which you can't go below, and what always happens is the cloud just is at the lower safe height. So now what you're doing, now what the student in the front is trying to do is going, fuck, what if, what if I don't hit, what if I don't get out of cloud until when I hit the lower safe? Because if, if you are at the lower safe, so there's the, it could be, there could be terrain up into this height. So if you're in cloud, you obviously don't know what's below you. So if you come down to that height and you're still in cloud, then you've got to go up, you've got to abort the mission. But that's a lot of work to do as well. So the students think, oh, no, I'm in cloud. What am I going to do? I've got these other aeroplanes. And poof, all of a sudden, you're outside of cloud. OK, now I need to change my priorities and go, right, I now need to hit that turn point. And what happens, you tend to be quite low. So you're going pretty fast. And you've got to split the formation off. So heaps of stuff is happening. So the big priority prioritization is find a turn point. If you do not find that first turn point low level, everything else gets really hard. Uh, and you're only going to map, map and you won't go to clock. So if you get to a turn point at the wrong time or in the wrong spot, you can do a, some sort of speed adjustment, some sort of heading adjustment, and do some mental calculation to figure out what time we're going to get to the next turn point. What's the fuel? What's the heading? So it gets really full on. So the first thing I try and teach the guys in a really high um, information-rich environment is prioritisation and that's work cycles. 
So what we always do when we hit a turn point, we say turn time torque fuel heading. So no what happens, that person knows, that trainee knows that me as a senior person, it doesn't matter if I don't find a turn point, I don't find a turn point. Let me within the ballpark, it doesn't really matter. But I bought myself time. I've got down to the time, okay, this is the time I should turn, I'm just gonna turn, I'm gonna do my work cycle. So immediately I've done some sort of prioritization and I made a decision. What I, what I often see students do is get down, can't find a turn point, and just keep tracking straight ahead. Like, you've got to do something, man. You've got to turn. You've got to do something. Because what are you going to do? Because we always do these with low on fuel. So we're always low on fuel. We're always trying to get back fuel just to add some more complexity into the environment, just like you guys, adding more complexity into the environment. So we need some sort of decision to turn. And so the prioritisation decision is really cool because now there's two non-technical skills that I can get back. I can debrief and I've got now shared language for as well. So yeah, we can, we can drill technical skills. But when we visualise non-technical skills, we've got some shared language and some shared behaviour we can talk about. Um, cool, so find the first turn point, all of a sudden I've done that prioritisation and now we're in the flow. So our kind of our, our opening move, we did it confidently. You know, it's the hardest part of the mission. Okay, I'm feeling pretty good. Now I'm feeling pretty good. I can, you know, start to think a bit more broadly. What's my fuel doing? What time are we looking at being at the target? What speed correction do I need to make? And things like that. Um, so we're trying to build confidence, stress management, and adaptability. Um, I think I think getting ahead, so we call it getting behind the drag curve. So when you're in an aeroplane, when you start to slow down, obviously you've got lift holding you in the air, you also got drag slowing you down. And when you get to a certain point and, and you're slowing right down, slowing right down, the aeroplane gets really draggy. And when it gets really draggy, you get to a point where that drag force equals lift and you fall out of the sky. As you're, pro as you're slowing down, so as your cognitive ability is slowing down and you get stuff to get really, really draggy, you need heaps and heaps and heaps of power to get back and fly the aeroplane. It's the same with cognition. When you start to slow down and get behind that eight ball, it's really hard to get back in the game, really, really hard. So we force people to make decisions. It doesn't matter if it's the wrong decision, it's a decision. You've interacted with the environment, now we have no more data to work with. That's really good. And we have some sort of work cycle for it. Um, yeah, so what I really try and do, I try and drill non-technical skills as well as technical skills. Uh, and the great thing is having confidence, having uh, situational awareness, I'm now reducing that interference. And that's, that's the key. I need to reduce interference so I can think, what's the right skill to use at the right time for the right outcome? And that skill can be a technical or a non-technical skill, or most times both of them at the same time. So all I'm trying to do when I work or, or, or I train mentors, I'm trying to get them to have a shared language around this and how to reduce that uncertainty um, in a psychological safe environment. I kind of like this. This is, Egan, this is actually out of the British Journal of Anesthetics. This is how they, they kind of mentor. I kind of like it. Um, it's good. So stage one is where am I? Stage two is where do I want to be? Stage three is how I'm going to get there. And that's a really great way to open a conversation with a mentee. Come to you, oh, I'm finding this really hard. I'm struggling with this. So starting with what's going on, man? What's trying to get goal state? You know, what, what's, what's really doing there? And then the second, so the blue part there is, uh, you know, what's the reality for you? You know, you're like, you're an intern. Like you shouldn't be performing like a consultant if that's, you know, so you need to give them some sort of reality and some sort of perspective as well. And then finding a way forward from that as well. So coming, so you're both working together saying, hey, look, let's have a goal in the next week, in the next month, in the next day or your next shift. Let's try and work on this and then come back to me and then see how that went. So as a mentor, so, so a coach um, very much is quiet and, and, and a coach philosophy is you have the answer inside of you. So I'm just gonna, be, I'm just gonna ask you some questions to bring the answer outside of you. You're a mentor, you have a experience. So you're gonna give some skills at the right time that person. So first set expectation and give them the skills to get to a point where they want to get to. So, they, so you both got the journey together really. Um, I won't talk too much about that. I could talk all day about, about that, that sort of model, but it's really being approachable. The other thing, the best mentor in the building is the person everyone goes to and talks to. Like you just stand back and see, see who people gra gra uh, gravitate to and go and ask them, hey, what are you doing? You know, a lot of it's personality based, but they might have some some of those golden nuggets that, hey, this, I talk to this person and I can just, you know, I can really resonate with what they say and I can put that into my practice and it actually does something different. So, you know, you come and, you know, I come and talk to you, probably won't change anything you do. But sometimes you talk to someone and it resonates with them and they go and try it, they go and try it you know, in the environment. Oh, that kind of worked, it kind of did. Then they come back and then we kind of then have that conversation. What, what, did, what worked, what didn't work? How can we change it? Okay, let's try something else for you as well. So it's really resonating with people and giving them really small bits of information. And I, I see when I train mentors, I want to give lots of information at once, like what I'm doing now, I'm trying to give you guys lots of information. When you're in a mentee relationship, because you work with them all the time, just give them one nugget of information, just one. Just let them talk. Because what I find, people find it really hard to think. You know, we've got phones, we've got computers, and, and we have all these experiences. 
but it's really hard to link those experiences up into a linear process into what does that actually mean for me and how can I now learn from that? It's really hard. But when you talk to someone, you really engage with that person and someone can talk for half an hour and they can actually concentrate and think about, I did this, this is the outcome, this is what I learned and this is how I'm going to you know, move forward. When you do it for yourself, it's actually really quite hard, but it's much better to do it with a mentee or someone that you really resonate with and someone you find can, can uh, you know, get the best out of you. Um, Tom. Oh, cool. So this here, we developed um, as part of elite sport, but it's made fighter pilots. So a lot of stuff. Air Force used to get a lot of a lot of um, coaches and psychologists from the AIS. Paid them heaps of money to come into the Air Force, and they gave us all these programs which didn't work. Because just like you guys in the Air Force, we're not athletes. We don't have a you know Olympic campaign, a really specific goal in four years, or I'm a pro sport. I have a goal every weekend, you know, to win a win a ball game. We don't have that. Jobs are always different. I've got a family. I'm fatigued. My, my life is not just my job. I've got heaps of shit going on. So I can't put 100% focus into what I'm doing. Um, when you look at an athlete, everything's home for the athlete to make that, you know, that microsecond, that millisecond, you know, every, everything's about about that person. Everything's focused toward that. And they've got really clear role articulation. Everything's really clear. They've got nutritionists. They've got physios. They've got doctors. they got everything. Like you guys in the military, we don't have any of that sort of thing. So we want this to be a pragmatic approach. Um, so my wife works at the trauma hospital in in uh, in, in Adelaide, and, and they love talking about all this sort of stuff. But fuck, you can't get a car park there. You know, there's no car park, or the pay's always wrong. There's really big things that really stop that sense of belonging, and that sense, hey, you know, my values are aligned with the values of this hospital. So you know, so now I can sort of work on these smaller things. So we need to do the basic things well before we start to look at look at this. Are your values and beliefs are they aligned with what you do as a job? Do you feel like the executive team is a tokenistic management or are you actually getting um, proper management about remit wellbeing? Are you being trained in that? Are you having enough time to train your skills? These are all the big things in the Air Force as well. These are the big things we work on first. And then once we've kind of got that in and around about way, which we never have in a perfect way, it's just how life is, we look at what you can focus on. What can you focus on? What can you can control in that environment? Um, so the things I'll probably talk about, the biggest ones I see is attitude, goals, commitment, and self-talk. That's probably the biggest three out of all those where people kind of stumble a little bit and find it hard to hard to talk to and hard to hard to teach. Um, so attitude I spoke a bit about there. So the perspective based on values, beliefs, and behavior. So do you feel, do you have do you get a sense of belonging? Do you feel you as a core person, are you a doctor, are you a paramedic, are you a nurse? Is, is that your calling? Do you feel that you're supported? Do you feel there's psychological safety? Do you walk away going, oh, man, I want to do something else? <laughs> How do you feel? So, so that's that's the first thing that we talk about. We develop language around it. Um, a lot of the times I go into a unit, into an executive team, and they say, hey, look, we've got a vision. So we've got, it's called a CO's, CO's mission statement. You know, it could be a director's mission statement. And it's very fluffy. It's pretty much bullshit, but it sort of says stuff that, they, you know, you know we want to have honesty, we want to have integrity, we want it really hard, we want to have really good life balance. But what does honesty, what does integrity mean? They aren't doing words, they're just like descriptors. It doesn't tell me what behaviour I need to enact to align myself to the to the vision or, or, or to the mission of, of the team or the organisation. What is wellness? What does that mean to me? So the first thing we do is make sure the mission or the vision of the organisation or the team is well articulated and what behaviours that we want to our people to enact to enact the, that vision. Um, and, and what you'll find is, yes, it's badly articulated, people are kind of doing it in, in general. Um, but because it's not, it doesn't feel like there's a sense of belonging, uh, people are like, oh, I don't really, uh, this job's okay, but I just don't feel like I belong to it. I just don't feel like these executive teams got my back. So we need to develop that, that communication and that lived experience that we can say, okay, I feel what I'm doing as a person is aligned with, 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 with what we should be doing. It's all about patient outcomes. I, I looked at the SA's, SA Health's, like a 50 page thing, and it was all that what we're going to do is about research, it's about KPIs, about patient outcome. There was zero in there about the uh, doctors or the paramedics or the nurses, about you know becoming the best they can be, doing training, making sure they're as competent as they can be. There's no focus on the care provider, all about the nice stuff, you know, we're not going to do ramping, we're not going to do this, and that's why people are burning out. So that's, that's, that's a big thing um, with attitude. Um, do you have a sense of belonging? Are these your people? Yeah, these are my people, you know, I feel pretty comfortable here. This, this is my sort of thing. Um, self-efficacy, imposter syndrome. And that, that's like banter around all the time. It's like wellness, imposter syndrome, resilience. I think that's pretty much a threat here all the time. 
the, what does it mean? So imposter syndrome, so I see that all the time. When I train instructors, I see it all the time. I say, oh, man, I've got to train these students, but I'm only a junior instructor. I think the best instructors I've ever seen have really strong imposter syndrome. And imposter syndrome is something, it's a behavioural trait, it's something you have and it's something you need to manage. Uh, a paper came out the other day saying the best doctors have the highest amount of imposter syndrome because it kind of makes sense. Um, if you've got a really strong ego, you think you're really, really good, you'll go down a direction that you want to go down and won't listen to anyone else. Oh, this is not going to do because I know I'm really good at it. And I only attend to information that confirms what I'm doing. If you're not quite sure, you know, you're, you're an insecure overachiever, so imposter syndrome, you will probably share a mental model. You will probably engage with the patient more because you want to get more of a picture. And you will start to reflect on, oh, okay, maybe it is not the right direction. I'm going to try something else. Now, you get imposter syndrome with maladaptive behaviour, and that's not cool. But if you get a mentor, if you have a mentor and someone with imposter syndrome, that person's going to be a really good human being. They're going to be awesome. In fact, when you're talking about how do I control, you know, mob mentality, someone that doesn't have imposter syndrome is someone I'm super experienced and I'm going to do it, that'd be shit in that situation. Someone that's like, oh, there's so much stuff going on, but you're all experts in your given field, so you give me the information, you know. I'll, I won't try and direct you. I'll say, okay, I'll get this information. I think, okay, I think this is the way forward. Any questions? Blah, blah, blah. No, okay, we're going to keep going. So it allows that self-reflection. So we, we demonise imposter syndrome. I think it's a positive, and literature starting to say, hey, you know what, it probably is a positive. Um, so this little graph here, or graph, is it? So if I was going to pick someone... Um, so the high performer is high values, right? Really high performer, but also a really great person. And their values match with what we believe is the required behaviour. It's pretty rare to get someone like that. When you get someone like that, we use them as an exemplar and we use them as kind of that person. Uh, not that we look up to, but they'll be a really good mentor to start to get the feel out with the unit, the you know, the department, the squadron, that this person's got some good stuff. This is what they've got to say. You never get that. So, oh, you know, it's very rare. But you've got two options. Would you take high performance low values or would you take low performance high values? Well, that question comes up quite a lot and I'd always take the bottom right because technical skills are easy to teach. We can drill them, no worries. We can slash them out. But if someone hasn't got those non-technical skills, hasn't got those values, hasn't got that, that right attitude, that's really hard to train. That's really, really hard. But we'd always take someone who's a lower performer that's high on non-technical skills because those implied on technical skills, there is some psychological traits that go with the adaptability of people to have that cognitive flexibility. Um, but technical skills, man, you can train a monkey to fly an aeroplane. You can train a monkey to fly an aeroplane really, really well, but you can't make decisions they couldn't do situational awareness. That's the really hard stuff. So when I'm looking um, to, to develop mentors for mentees, I'll try and find someone that can articulate their feelings quite well, or can articulate things that are hard to articulate and has the time and the capacity to, to want to do that. And I think that's a really important point. When I'm trying to change a culture, like small, small, like a unit squadron, um, I really want to find that person that can articulate this sort of language. Because then you start to develop it through the unit, you start to get that sort of psychological safety. Oh, that, that dude is happy to speak about this. Maybe I should speak about this. And it really starts to get a snowball effect. So strategies um, for developing this language, when you're talking to people, try and have above the line language. So a lot of people that's got a bit of a negative attitude at work, be like, this is too hard, or this ranking's fucked, or <laughs> whatever the case might be. But then if, if you just small words, hey, what can you do right now to change this? Or how can you change uh, your view on that? Who can you use to help you to do this? So just changing, just flicking some of that language around, uh, really empowering as well. Um, just make sure, yeah, I won't go into that. Uh, externalising. So there's two ways of externalising. There's one, you hear um, everything that was really good is because of me and everything that was really shit was because of something else. Or the other way around, everything that was really good was because of that team. But, you know, I, I kept stuffing up. So so make sure that externalising is not a maladaptive behaviour. Um, I do hear a lot of people say that, oh, I just fluked that. How did you go? Oh, yeah, it went pretty well. But, you know, I just fluked it. They kind of don't have that self They're really good, but they don't have that self-efficacy. So, so bring that out. And more, someone that um, doesn't want to have accountability and blames others for stuff that they can't control, that needs to be addressed as well because that can be, that can be so toxic through an environment. Um, yeah, that's gonna be really, really toxic. So, so that, that that language is really important to pick up pick up early as a mentor. I'll talk about the kids' reflective cycle. We'll jump into that um, chunking. Sometimes people think too broadly. Oh, this, you know, I can't get patients onto the onto the ward. But ramping. Well, what can you do now? Like, let's chunk it down. What are you in control of right now? Um, small things. Yeah. So, so, so just change. And when you are mentoring a mentee, and you do get some of that language where it's out of their control. 
No, I acknowledge it. That's that's fine. It's good you're thinking broadly, but let's see what you can actually control and then develop a uh, protocol around around doing that. Um, social cognitive theory, role modelling. People will watch other people and how they act and look at how they are perceived and the interaction and the output that they have. So make sure you are um, socially or you are role modelling the correct behaviour. I mean, you guys don't really need to. You probably do it all the time. Uh, mantras. I spoke about mantras, sort of linking that. When something goes really well, having a key word for it, even going you know, with your mentor, just saying a little key word and then keeping that going, keeping that common narrative going. So when things go hard and then they get that negative automatic thoughts. So it's really easy for someone then to get on a, just stuff doesn't work for them for a week or so. And you can reflect back and you can disprove that negative automatic thought. Hey, remember when this happened? Oh, yeah, yeah. So just loop, always trying to loop them back into a positive mindset um, with examples. So, It'd be much harder to do in a hospital because obviously you've got, you know, crews changing, teams changing all the time. In a small environment like this, maybe it could be a possibility um, to do it here as well. Uh, you have information I spoke about. So, so we use a good enough for government work. Um, so when we're flying, so this picture here in, in formation, it's really hard to fly in close formation, especially when it's really bumpy, um, really turbulent. It's really hard to fly in close formation. So we're constantly making corrections, constantly making corrections. So we're not. So I've got their perfection. How do I move the... Uh, Oh, thanks very much. <laughs> so perfection versus excellence. Perfection would say, thank you. Perfection would say that if you're flying close to motion, you should never ever be out of position, and that's what you strive for. And it's really toxic. It doesn't work because that is not reality. Excellence is saying, hey, look, I'm going to be out of position a fair bit because it's bumpy, but that's cool. I'm only fighting to be flying those. So we use cues on the aeroplane. I'm only fighting to fly and hold those cues. So when someone starts to speak about perfectionism. It really, it's really bad for psychological safety because it says you can't make a mistake or if you decide you're going to do a certain protocol, procedure or an algorithm, you're going to change it because that shows, oh, you might have made a mistake or you haven't sort of you know, interpreted the information correctly. So, so never, ever, ever work for perfectionism, work for excellence. And excellence is fine. Hey, look, I've gone down this route. Now I've got new information. I'm going to refine what I'm doing. I'm going to be adapted to the situation. Um, so, yeah, the excellence versus perfe uh, perfectionism is, is really important. Uh, I find with a lot of pilots... Um, junior pilots who were ex-engineers, and engineers love love the exacting perfectionism. And I've never ever passed completed. You know, I've never seen an engineer pass pilot course ever because of that perfectionism trait. They want to know more and more. Why do you do that? Why do you do that? Well, you don't even know why you do that, man. You just do that. You just look at that picture and you make that work. But I need to know why. I need to have it exact. It just it just saps it. So it saps. It just puts so much technical skills into one thing. You have no time for non-technical skills and all of a sudden all interference builds up and they just cannot learn at the, the required rate. So if you're a mentor and just be really careful um, that someone is not trying to, you know, do the perfect, whatever it might be. This is a really great way if you want to talk to someone in, 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 a, men <laughs> in, in a mentoring context, you're not really sure how you want to talk to them. Um, there's heaps of different ways. You can use this one here. It's just a nice one. It's sort of, you know, it's like another algorithm. So with a description of what happened, make sure, so say, say something's happened and someone wants to talk about it, not for the technical side, but for how they felt. Make sure you define that situation. It's simply like, oh, this sort of happened. What actually was the point of the list of views then become really, not maladaptive, but really have that emotional elicitation. What was the exact point? Um, so you need, you need to drive down into that. And that's open ended questioning and positive affirmation. So what were you thinking, what were you feeling, what did it feel like, what did it sound like, what did it look like, what did it taste like? Um, was it a good or a bad experience? I wouldn't use those words, say how was the experience. I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't tie good and bad to an experience at all. Uh, what else can you make in the situation? Some people are doing so much stuff unconsciously, so when we start to talk about it and you bring some points out, oh yeah, I can do that. So really trying to make the unconscious conscious. Uh, and what else could have been done? This kid, you can actually train people to do it real time. They go into a situation, oh shit, they go to the sympathetic response, oh no, that's okay, that's okay, it's last time it happened, the outcome was pretty good, okay, now that feels good. So what did I do last time, I, you know, I, I used a, a, a secondary server, it's something that came, so I did that. So now I'm reflecting back, hey, so I'm going to do it this time, I'm going to see how it goes, and when I get more information, I'll adjust. So this self reflection should be happening all the time, should be happening all the time to refine what we're doing. Um, and I'll try and drill that into people a lot as well. That old smart goal stuff. I mean, yeah, we learned smart goals, but what? That's cool. Um, it's really, you know, we, everything's goals, right? So when I say smart goals, people are like, oh, this is like NTS 101. And it kind of is. We, you know, we think about a goal being a week or a month or, or you know, a couple of days down the track. But everything you do, 
all your behaviour is goal directed. Everything is goal directed. Um, so you might have in a hospital, you, know, you guys bring in a patient, you have a trauma team there, and the person running the trauma team might say, okay, in five minutes, I want to do three things with the patient, you know, bang, bang, bang. You already got a goal. So you've got more articulation, you've got a goal, and it's time bound and it's realistic. Because I mean, you're not going to get 10 things done in five minutes on that patient, you do the basic, you know, the basic three things. So if you look at smart goal specific, it's measurable, it's attainable, obviously it's relevant and it's time bound. So we're actually naturally doing this. But what it does, it keeps that momentum going. You have a strong opening play, boom. All right, and now we've got five minutes. And now you as a leader can stand back a bit because anything you can do, someone else can do, get the other person to do it. Because your goal is to be, you know, you're like, like a conductor. You're running an orchestra. So you don't want to be doing too much technical skill stuff. Obviously, when it's you and the paramedic, what you are. Um, that's why when you should go into the scene, you're not doing anything. So you're sort of seeing what's going on as well. You're developing those goals. You're developing those opening moves, coming strong. So if you come in and you're like, oh, not really sure what to do and you don't come in that strong, Start to lose confidence, start to get that interference, then you get back a drag curve. You need a really big oomph to sort of get back over to, to where you need to be. When things aren't going well, think, what is the goal? Where am I now? Where do I want to be? And how am I going to get there? Always ask yourself that question. If you don't know what that what, what that is, set a goal and start doing it, whether it be team or individual, really important. Um, yeah, also it's uncertainty because now we've done something, we're moving forward. Now we're moving forward in time, information's coming in and we're gathering information. Um, Allow space to share mental models. Yep. So some people won't share mental models, some people will share mental models. Some people are process driven, some people are team driven, some people are performance driven. That's sort of these three basic motivations. Um, when I see simulations, it's really easy to see who is who. Some people just constantly talk, constantly share mental models, which is good and bad. Uh, well, some people be really quiet. They'll be really, really quiet because that's who they are as a person. And that's cool. All it means is Prior to that, you set the expectation that, hey, this, these are going to be my three plans of attack. You know, I might, mightn't be that verbal because that's just who I am and when I work really hard, I kind of get, you know, quiet, which is fine, but at least the team kind of knows where you're going. For a flash mob, obviously challenging. For a flash mob, if you're very good at sharing mental models and you are a team sort of extroverted person, then that's going to be awesome. But at the same time, you're sharing all this information, well, where's the time to bring in information and start to assess? So everything's got their kind of pros and cons. Understand who you are, how you work within a team, and then if flash mob's hard, but if it's in a hospital setting, well, it's a bit easier to sort of brief this how I'm going to be, or even uh, having your buddy, so doctor, paramedic, so one or the other. This is who I am. I'm a performance person. I'm a team person. And what you tend to find, that changes. So if you're, and quite often, quite quite commonly, you have someone who, you know, team person might talk a lot. As soon as they get under stress, they become really quiet. And that's really good because now that paramedic or a doctor, depending who the offsider is, they can see that. Oh, fuck, they're becoming really quiet. So I think they're becoming under stress. So look, can I offer, hey, do you need anything? Or what do you think about this? Or what about that? So now you're kind of working as a team. I know how you change. You know how I change. So when that happens, that person's loading up. They're loading up. I need to offload them. I need to get rid of some of that interference. So you're trying to play it like that. Um, I'll just skip that bit there. So yeah, so always everyone on that team should know what's going on, what's the, what's the common goal in that five minutes or whatever that time period is, and what am I doing in that role to actually achieve that? Um, what you don't want are those people in the team that just wait for the leader to say something because that is burn that leader out. They don't have time to stand back, get the information. You're the leader as a conductor, and you're the highly skilled person running running something, you know, doing something and giving you know information back into the team. Um, so we all talk about team goals and goal setting. Have a, have a personal goal as well. I always tell the mentors or mentees I work with, all the students I work with, yeah, we're going to have a whole bunch of aims and a whole bunch of goals for this mission. You just have a couple of personal goals. You know, I want to feel good. Or, you know, often, often, sorry, often I say I want to feel good. Make it much more specific. I want to have really sharp communication. I want to make sure that what I'm saying is goal directly. I don't want to have fluffy communication. I want to try and control that flash mob. And controlling the flash mob will mean I've got quite a good essay. So give yourself some non-technical skill, small goals, and then just self-reflect on that as well. Um, and that'll also help you develop language. And when you develop language around it, you can then start to teach it to, to your juniors coming through as well. So this one here literally kills people. Um, not kills people, but this one here I, I see so paralyzing. And the thing is, a lot of times unconscious, a lot of, unconscious, and a lot of, a lot of the times it's not a verbal thing. So for me, when I'm in an aeroplane, I'm working really hard, I start to cognitively overload. I get this really hot, sort of not pain, this heat sensation at the back of my head, or at the back of my neck into my head. That's my tip to 
something's not right. I'm working really hard here and I'm starting to find this as a threat. So I'm now going to have a maladaptive behaviour. So for example, when I find inflammation, where should I find two fingers on the control column? Because, you know, you, just, you move, back, move back a little bit, it's gone. We fly really light on the control column. When I'm flying inflammation, so we're coming in for an air show, and the whole thing, we'll do stuff out in the area, and then when we come past the air show, well, that's when it's all happening. And what I find myself doing is I get pretty hot. I'm on the wings, pretty bumpy. I start to hold really tight. And it's really maladaptive behaviour. And then I'll start to sort of push and pull, push and pull, and it'll just be, oh, what the fuck am I doing? And so having that self-reflection or having that ability to go, I'm saying that feel negative, I'm starting to feel like I don't have the ability to actually fly in this close remote. Everyone else is really tight. I'm starting to get out of control. I mean, from the from the ground looking up, you would never know. In my head, I feel like this is negative and this is not good. Even though it can be really small and maybe not even perceivable, perceivable to others, to you it's massive and it's catastrophic. And, and that's what it is. That's your reality and that's cool. Um, so what I think about self-instruct, I self-instruct, I think, what do I tell a student in the front? That's right. Fingers. Okay, so I do my fingers first. I do my fingers, I start to relax. Okay, what are the cues? Height, line, speed, height. Line, speed. So I start to, I start to self-instruct and I start to verbalise. So I get myself out of my head. When I get myself out of my head and I start to, you know, self-instruct, that feeling starts to go away as well. Um, and because I get that, or some people get in their chest, that's a shared language. Now I can say, you know, I, I, uh, I'm happy to, to share it with others that, hey, look, I'm not that good at formation, and this is the feelings I get. And then, hey, actually, I get the same. And now we can start to drill out. And hey, what do we do? Okay, we get light in the control column, we go height, line, speed, or, or we do a certain work cycle. So now we've got to. We can almost anticipate when we're starting to get quite cognitively overloaded. Um, keyword association. Uh, yep, so we're going to keyword association. I, I really think it's gold. If you can see someone doing something really well and have a keyword that resonates with them, I mean, and, and, and then you almost, you almost drill that when, every, when something goes right. It's the fastest way to get out of that negative automatic thought. It's really fast and it's really, really effective. And the really cool thing being a fly instructor is effectively you fly three times a day in the back seat. And you can run your own social experiment with a student in the front. You try so many different things and you can see what works and what doesn't. And we do it all the time. So over long periods of time with lots of instructors, you know, controlling the variability, you can see what works and what doesn't in high risk and high stress environments, just, just like yours. Unfortunately, you don't have time to drill all the time because you're actually doing real jobs all the time. You have very limited time to simulate, but we do it literally all the time. That's all we do is simulate. Um, so we can see this, this stuff does work. That keyword association does work, but personality based. Sometimes we're tokenistic and it won't work and it'll actually do the opposite thing. So you need to have that um, that real resonance with that person and you need to have that that, that relationship. If you don't have that relationship, that's the, not the therapeutic relationship, but you don't have that relationship, you get nothing out of this. All this stuff is just words and it doesn't resonate. So you need to have that relationship. You need to take the time to understand that person. Obviously, you're not going to work in flash mobs, but when you're working in a team, in a, in, in a cohesive team and in a mentor relationship, it works really well. Um, yep. So if you're trying to... Okay. So we're trying to develop language around this. So I work with an elite swimmer, and they just need to the calm games. And uh, so right, I was in the people who thought, So what was the situation? So we drew it down, and it was like 20 back to the second, like nothing. So first of all, it's catastrophic, but you do it like 19. You must have not to a 26 and you're two of the second. But to them, it's catastrophic. And you need to go on that same journey too, because it is catastrophic. You don't like the guy and whatever, but you need to understand who it's catastrophic. Okay? So that's the situation. So we really we drew it down to that. Now, the thing is, they might know what they're thinking. They might know what they're thinking. They might know what the behaviour is. But they're probably the emotions. They're probably going, you know what? And it tends to be a swear word, uh, or it tends to be something that's not a well defined emotion. So if ever you're talking to someone and they're not really sure what's going on, I like to use this chart. And I just like to talk around it. I like to just write words down. Words down for emotions, words down for thought, words down for behaviour and, and physical reaction. And all you're doing is taking them on their own journey to then unpack themselves, but you're using it through a framework. Um, but the key is the situation. Make sure the situation is really, really specific so they can really drill down on, okay, what actually happened. And I really kind of like this model because this gives you a bit more language and, and a bit more structure around, okay, because what you want to do eventually come down to behaviour. Is it adaptive or is it not adaptive? And then from the behaviour, we need to change the thought pattern. And, and, and when I change the thought pattern on this, okay, so you're on an Olympic campaign, you missed the Common Games trials, who cares? You're still on an Olympic campaign. You've still got four years, you're 18, you're 19. Okay, now they start to have a look. What can you control right now? What can you go in that pool when you go to train this afternoon? What can you do? So then we try and drill down on, on what they actually can do. What can they control? What can't they control? Um, and, and once again, you need to take them on the journey. Um, but you guys have so much experience, so you guys can use some techniques that you use as well. Hey, I do this, what do you think about that? Well, yeah, it might work. Okay, go and try that. Come back, let's reflect, and, and let's see if it works. It may not. 
Um, yep, thought stopping. So replace it with a mantra. Um, reframing I've spoken about. Mindfulness. Mindfulness is spoken about a lot. All this is a down cost or something. So it might be you, current patient notes in the hospital, and then nurse comes and goes, can you read the CCT? So can you go from doing this, typing notes up, to then have 100% focus on the nurse and the ECG, yes, no? And if you can, you're practicing mindfulness. If you can't, and I can't, I couldn't do that. So quite often we'll be writing a student write-up and the student will come in, can I talk to you? So I actually have a work cycle for that. So I say, hey, man, yeah, no worries, dude. Like, I want to give you 100% of my time, and that's cool. I'll give you 100% of my time. But right now I can't give you 100% of my time. Give me five minutes and then we're good to go. And that kind of buys me time, buys them time, and it allows me to practice that mindfulness. But, you know, I'm going to finish this right up. I'm going to leave that cognitively and I'm going to engage in that. Now, the nurse might go, just, just read it now. So it may not work, it may work, but you need to try and practice mindfulness. Switch that off, it's too much interference in, in what your other job is. We're always practicing mindfulness. Just be, um, just realize that you are and, and, and really try and switch off from one to the other. And, and if you can't, especially with fatigue, fatigue always affects this as well. Um, make sure you verbalize that. Make sure that, you know, hey, look, try to do this. Like, yeah, sure, I'll have a look at it, but I'm not fully in the, you know, I'm not fully in the game. So tell yourself that and then, hey, I'm not fully in the game here. I might get my colleague to have a look as well. So at least you've got a bit of peer-to-peer -peer support. So, you know, you're a bit fatigued. You know, you can't be fully, you, you know, you call it mindfulness, you know, I just call it focus. If I can't be fully focused, I use my team around me. Hey, can you have a look at this as well? Uh, yeah, that's probably enough for that. So let's quickly scroll out to um, more of an organisation. Um, so let's have a look. Let's ignore mediators. Let's just look at workplace context. So what are the demands? What are the resources? Let's ignore this control for individual variables. So leave that. So let's look at demand resources and outcomes. So I spoke to um, the executive team at the at the trauma hospital the other day, and and uh, and it's at wellness. Um, you know, so so we want we want our doctors to do better because I'm working really hard. I don't really know how to, you know, how to, to motivate them to be resilient. It's like, what do you mean to be resilient? I'm pretty sure the fact that what you're doing, you are resilient. So what, what you tend to find is these tokenistic approaches, whether it be resilience, whether it be wellness, whether it be whatever, we always think, you know, let's have docs, socks to docs day or let's, uh, let's bring a puppy in or there's just something that doesn't kind of, and then they go, how, how come, Hey, how come we still got all this all this blockage? And how come people are reporting that they are just so stressed out and, and they're really, really burnt out? And then we're watching the reg group and the reg group's like, what is this shit? I can't believe they're doing this and that. It's because we forget about those individual needs. So when we look at an organization, then we really forget about individual needs. This is really good, isn't it? A mental relationship as well. So what I tend to find when I talk to people um, in units, military units, I'll talk about oh, these are the needs, these are the demands, this is the resources we have, and this is kind of the outcome. But they never really talk about this stuff in the middle here. So whenever you are mentoring someone that has that um, broader thinking that's saying, oh, you know, the executive team's doing this or I just don't understand what, why we have to do all this, really try and just aim at the basic psychological needs and the motivators um, as a mentor. So do you feel like you have locus of control? Do you feel confident in what you do? And do you have a sense of belonging? And if you do, what, you, what, what are your internal motivators? Are you motivated by the process or, or the outcome? Are you motivated by working in the team or just the outcome of the patient or both? Uh, and, and external motivators. The other day, uh, an email came out from the executive team to, to the RA, to, to, the, to the hospital, saying, oh, yeah, great job. Doesn't really do anything. What, 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 what's really empowering is if you work with a consultant, a senior consultant, and they say, hey, this easy work, that was really good. Like, I really appreciate you coming in and, and then just giving a bit more. You know, that one-on-one, -on -one, it means a lot, but um, that broader tokenistic approach, you'll tend to find when you're mentoring your juniors, that really piss them off. And so you need to know how to you need to know how to talk to that, um, and you need to know how to talk to those basic psychological needs and those intrinsic motivators. So everything you do, if it's not based on on those two fundamental um, characteristics, won't really have too much of an effect. Uh, this is what we did for the Air Force. So um, the bottom line there is your basic foundational behaviours. So your individual, how you work in a team, and how you work in an organisation. All it really was, what we want to try and do is give this to units and squadrons. Uh, and, and departments say, hey, here's some stuff. Okay. I mean, we're not forcing you to do anything, but when you're looking um, at jobs that are quite chaotic, the role articulation, jobs are always changing, roles are always changing, you know, flash mobs, everything's, you know, full on. Are we doing the basics well? If you're doing the basics well, everything else will hopefully start to fall into place. So, you know, you get the flash mobs coming or you've got whatever's going. If you're doing the basics well, 
kind of 90% of the way there. Um, so that bottom line, you know, wellness, and I'll talk about wellness in, in, in a second, uh, recovery optimization. Unfortunately, the people that wrote this are from sporting background. So if you read that, a lot of the stuff is, it doesn't really resonate. But you, but you can take different things out of it. So recovery optimization, one big thing in recovery is are you leaving work? Are you debriefing before you leave work? Are you just talking to someone, a peer, and are you just venting? Because if you don't vent, you take that home, it'll stay with you, it'll resonate with you, and then you come to work the next day feeling burnt out. So that recovery optimization, are you leaving work at work? And if, if you're not, why not? And how can you do it? Who can you talk to just to have that shared experience? Are you doing that? Uh, so when, when I work with mentor with, with mentees, we talk about that. What are they taking home? What, what can you leave at work? Some people can't leave stuff at work. And that's kind of how it is. So we talk about what can you do at home? What can you do? Can you have little things? So when you turn the car, the, the car off, can you stop thinking about that patient? When you get out of the car, can you stop thinking about that person? Can you stop thinking about that person? And then when you start to ruminate about it, then what can you do? Um, nutrition, uh, self-reflection, mindfulness, uh, sleep optimization. So we don't have that. Like we just don't. We all have kids. You know, we just. Things are hard. But what you can do is have protocols in place so you can have people making sure you've got your back, you know, double-checking yourself, making sure you're going to go and do this. Should go and check with someone else. Am I really fatigued? Because when we're really fatigued, we rely on those cognitive shortcuts, so those biases, and because we'll, it, it's easier. Because we're used to, you know, I saw this before, so this is what's happening now, so I'm going to do this certain procedure or this certain protocol. And the more tired you are, the more you do that. So the MRCs, so the, the, the consultants that are on the phone for, you know, for when they start call up and they're, you know, arranging the hospitals and whatnot, they'll do 24-hour shifts. And that's that's cool that if you're really experienced and you're really seeing you're doing 24-hour shift and, you know what, you do have cognitive biases and you will use cognitive biases, but they're pretty good because you have so much experience. And what's really uncool, when you get a really junior MRC in there, so a medical treatment consultant in there, it's really fatigued and really stressed. That's going to start to do these biases and the outcomes can be really poor. Now they change that. I think it's now 12 hour shifts. But the problem is that whenever things change, it's done by the senior team. Oh, it's fine for me. Like, what are they complaining about? But if you look at the psychology of it, that yeah, we are we do use cognitive shortcuts and we do use cognitive biases. And the more tired you are, the more you use it. And the more junior are junior you are, the more incorrect that can probably be. So we should be careful with who we were using um, with seat optimization. When you look at a team. There's all leadership stuff there, there in the team. Uh, for the communication, I won't talk to you. That's like a whole day, day sort of thing. Um, share responsibility, leading the team, just allowing people to do their role, be a leader within their role, and you're just standing back like like in the orchestra, which I, which I spoke about. And then once we're at the team, we actually go doing the job. So mental agility. Mental agility is the ability to stand back. It's the ability to, okay, I'm going to make a decision. I'm now going to stand back and make sure that the information is either corresponding or it's saying, hey, this probably isn't the right way or you need to do something else there. I won't talk too much more about that. Um, this thing here, everyone goes on about wellness. Air Force love wellness. We, I'm part of a, of a working group with the suicide awareness or the suicide awareness, with the suicide working group. A lot of people are really struggling in the Air Force. Uh, what the military used to do is, uh, you know, we fought overseas for 20 years. And it was a pretty, pretty standard cycle. So you'd be at home for nine months, you'd go away for three months, fight the war, you'd do your skill, and then you'd come home and you'd train for that specific thing. And then what you think is, hey, the war's gone now, it should be really good, but it's actually not. Because the people that we recruit wanted to do that and they want they want that sort of that continual cycle. They just want that predictability and we don't have it. Now, the whole geopolitical environment is changing. War fighting's changing. People don't know what they're doing. So I'll go into units and uh, we'll, we'll look at, you know, teamwork and this, that, and the other. I'm like, hey, you should have that. I don't actually know my role. What is my role articulation? You know, am I and am I trained for that? And what does it mean to the broader group? So now, now my values and my beliefs aren't really aligned with what we were doing. So now I kind of don't know, don't know where I am. So wellness was was something that we started looking at. Um, not happiness. So we went into quite a few years talking about wellness and like, oh, I'm talking about wellness. There's more fights. I'm talking about wellness. But all it was because it's was such a fluffy kind of term. We really try to operationalize it and define it. And we try to define it as we want your behaviour to be adaptive to whatever you do. So you're going to be coming into work with adaptive behaviour. Because if you start to develop this maladaptive behaviour, negative automatic thoughts, that's toxic through the work unit, and then we're kind of in a really bad situation, like we are now, not like we are now, but in some units where there's really high suicide rates, there's really you know, low levels of engagement, um, and technical skill drops off as well massively as, as, as a consequence. Um, so so, for, so we, we do a lot of surveys. Air Force have lots of surveys. We use KPMG, we have millions of dollars to all these surveys. They always come back every year the same, stress and fatigue really, really high all the time. 
The stress and fatigue is not as a byproduct of a lot of things. It's a byproduct of engagement. It's a byproduct of enjoying your job. So you can so I can go to work and be really engaged in my job. Feel like I've got a real strong sense of efficacy. I'm I'm really good at what I do. I can get flogged hard. I'm gonna do three missions a day. I'm gonna do all these write-ups. I've got secondary duties I've got to do. I might start work at seven and finish work at nine o'clock at night. Then I'm gonna go home. I can be 100% well. I can, you know, I'm not happy about it. I just wouldn't be at home. But I feel good. I feel like I'm doing something purposeful. I've got belonging and I'm engaged. So when we don't have those three things, we tend to see the shared language as fatigue and stress. So when we're doing surveys within units or you're mentoring someone and saying, I'm quite, quite fatigued and I'm quite stressed, what does it mean to you? Like, what is it? You need, you need to dig down. And a lot of times, it's not stress and fatigue. Um, you know, it might be a bit of fatigue, yeah, it might be a bit of stress, but the driver is not that. So that's a really important thing. And, and developing language around how do you talk, talk about that? And if you do bring things up, how do you respond to it? So when we train mentors, a lot of the times, or talk um, or, or instructors, be prepared. This is your scope of practice. So there's stuff that you can't handle. What are you going to do? Who are you going to direct them to? What information are you going to send them to? And how will you make sure safety? So what is psychological safety? Oh, I can bring my true self to work. I can I can work really hard. I can make mistakes. I'm not punitive. And people are all trying their best for the best outcome. Um, now, I would imagine that if you're a locum nurse, helping an airway doctor in a trauma in a major hospital, you're not going to stand up and you're not going to say, oh, I don't think that's right. Or I don't think for that nurse, would they have psychological safety? Would they be able to be confident? I'm going to try really hard and make a mistake. It'll be fine. So that's a conversation that I really think needs to be on a smaller scale. When we say we're going to have psychological safety, I really like to bring that into a small scale, a small scale of a small team. So that airway doctor, airway nurse, let's have a chat up, let's have a coffee afterwards. I mean, this is obviously in a, not in the real world because you're so flat out, but Let's have a conversation. Hey, what did you think about that situation? Would you would you have spoken up? And what that empowers that person as well. You're asking them, you're empowering them to go, hey, you know what? I probably wouldn't have. And why wouldn't you? Now, as, as a senior doctor, as a lot of you what you are, okay, so what's going on here? How come that, that's not being developed? Now you as a leader can start to think, as a leader of people, can start to think, okay, so why isn't there psychological safety? Or, or you know, we banter it around, we, we talk about we should have it, but actually is there psychological safety? So I'll just finish off. This is from the SAS mission team self. I really like it. Um, so you wouldn't think those sort of guys you know, are into this, but they are like big time. But they're very different to how we all operate because that team, their team stays together all the time. They don't have flash mobs. It's not how, how they work. Um, but it's the outcomes of mission. But equally important is the team and the self. So values, beliefs and ability, that's kind of those basic psychological needs. And then you make sure they're met. And if they're not, how do we meet them? The team, um, Communication is a big one in the team, not just communication, teamwork communication, but this is how I feel. I don't feel like I'm contributing or I don't feel like, you know, I can bring my true self. Because if you don't bring your true self to a situation, that takes away cognitive capacity. That's all it comes down to at the end of the day. For you to be excellent at what you do and be a really good person and, and make sure that you can resonate and understand others' unique capacity. And as soon as you come in as an actor and think, I need to have some sort of ego or I can't say, hey, I'm finding this hard or fatigued or I'm tired, we're taking away cognitive capacity because you're acting out. So you need to really come there as your true self, as your professional true self. Um, that's probably the biggest one. Uh, and then we get into the mission. So that mission is around a brief debrief. Uh, I'm talking about dichotomy. Everyone, everyone loves a debrief. We'll talk about debrief is a real sexy thing to have in like medicine and flight. But the brief's the big thing. The brief's the brief sets, sets the mental model. It sets the trajectory of what's going to happen. Because all the debrief should really be as what happened, did it go to plan? Yes, no, no. Why didn't it go to plan? And how can we fix it for next time? So you've kind of already done a lot of it in the brief. Um, so briefing is really, so we use SMEAC, and I've noticed, I was chatting about SMEAC, and now I notice MedStar use SMEAC. I was like, man, that was my, that was my. So SMEAC is really, it's a situation, mission, um, execution, admin, and communication. And you can do it within two minutes. You can effectively walk to the scene and, and talk about the situation, what's happening, mission, um, what is the outcome? So, so what's happening now, situation, mission, where do I want to get to, execution, how am I going to do it? We always finish with execution, with how am I going to do it, because you don't want to finish with this is where I want to get to, because you will have forgotten well, how am I going to get there. So, yeah, so what's going on? What's the outcome? You might know the full outcome. You might just want to know I want something, you know, goal-directed behaviour, I want to do something in the next five minutes. This is how I'm going to do it. Um, and then admin and long communication. Um, admin and log are about roles, so I'll, I'll have roles and responsibilities, uh, and I'll also have this is what I want to do now, and this is what I want to do second, this is what I want to do third. 
and then our communication. With communication for us in the military, it's really uh, critical because in a cockpit, you can't see the other person, you can't see anything, it's just all you can do is hear. So we have really solid communication plans. We have um, closed loop communication, so if I say something, they'll repeat it back to me. Um, so we're going to do some um, basic fight and maneuvering. We'll say fights on, dash one, fights on, dash two, fights on, fights on, go. So there's a lot of to and froing there because we're working in a really high stress environment. Um, if I was drawing up drugs, for example, or I was, I was reading out a runway, uh, you want 30 milligrams. I'll say I want three zero milligrams, and they'll repeat back three zero milligrams. Or uh, clear, clear the land, runway one eight left, one eight left, clear the land. So I'm making those numbers really. Uh, really um, accented and, and really obvious for the person. So 30 versus 30, so always use 30 or 30, 30. So you can use both of those. Especially when you're fatigued, um, communication is really important. Fatigue, high stress, high workload, low failure tolerance. Um, silent cockpit, when we're doing something, so maybe you've, you know, you've done the RSI and, and now you're doing the intubation, like do you say, okay, we're gonna do it silently? Done, no worries. So yeah, so, so, so it's really about that communication and then with the mission, making sure it's well, well articulated. And that, I'll skip through that. So 10 keys to success, I'll just leave it there. Uh, it's pretty much everything I've, I've spoken about to, to kind of sum up. Um, yeah. Any questions? Awesome. Thanks, Simon. Um, I think there's, uh, there's, there's a lot of stuff there that we, um, uh, we can take from that and also sort of echo through. After. Thanks, Carol. Uh, yeah, thanks. This is just for people online to be able to hear as well, Simon. So, yeah, lots of stuff that echoes you know, what we what we tr try to do here, um, uh, and lots of little tips. I particularly like some of the stuff around the mentoring and how we can approach. I think that's something we, at, at all stages of our careers, we can do better. Um, keen to get any other thoughts from from you guys as well and questions. One thing I did. Uh, think that'd be useful coming back to some of the coaching stuff and from the simulation point of view pretty much everyone here is either somewhat recent recently been through the induction program or faculty on that program and a nice little opportunity to sort of pull back the curtain a bit on on how we think about that and I think a lot of the stuff that you talked about we try to incorporate um, in particular the the coaching side of things and the way we sort of put together that induction program is um, you know, more explicitly for you guys to see now how we try to build it as a, you know, give you some of those building blocks, um, workshops, all that sort of thing, building out the, the simulations, you know, it starts with some of those, the pause and discuss kind of simulation, that opportunity to try and sort of coach things through um, and then sort of building to, to, towards the more immersive simulations. It's difficult still in such a short period of time to, to achieve that. But I think those kind of principles is you know, it's useful to build into any education or sort of sessions that that we're running. Um, once we get on, you know, more operational and doing simulations later, then a lot of those foundations are already built so we can we can launch into more immersive simulations sometimes, you know, when we're on shift or that sort of thing. Um, but still the idea of kind of coaching people through what the expectations are, what you want to get out of something, is just going to you know, help deliver a, a better outcome from that little session. And that, that sort of mantra that you've heard us, you know, Claire and all the team bang on about is sort of sim really being an opportunity to uh, rehearse what good looks like, um, I think really sort of echoes some of the, the stuff that you're, you're talking there from the coaching point of view and the, the briefing people beforehand. Um, yeah, I just thought that was a nice little opportunity to you know, pull back the curtain a bit, but open to any other thoughts and um, and, uh, and questions for Simon. Thanks, Simon. I guess um, a lot of us work in different sort of environments some high performing, some sort of lower performing. How do you approach an organization or an environment or potentially another workplace and engender those qualities of high performance in the staff that work there? Yeah, the first thing I do is work with the executive team to see what are they doing to start with. So what is that, what is that vision, what is that mission, what is the articulation of, of what are the behaviors that you need? And then so I have that, I have that as a separate conversation. And I'm going to speak to the people in the cold face and say, what do you do? 
and what behaviour underpins that. And like you said, um, so Air Force, just like in, in medicine, you have high performers and you have, you, have, you know, middle of the road performers. And, and the job may not require that high technical skill as well. The big thing there is engagement, doing the basics well, but knowing what those basics are, uh, and having that shared language. So what you tend to find is there's a really big disconnect between, hey, we're, we're war fires and exec team, this really big thing, but we've already been taught to do this. And now all of a sudden there's this almost, this rift, we, we don't understand what's going on. So that, that not, the executive team not taking people on that journey of what we require and how we're going to train is really hard. Because everyone wants to do their best, yeah. And by and large, they want, they want to do their best. They want to be told what their best is, what behaviour does that look like, and am I trained for that as well? So a lot of the times, <clears throat> they won't be trained for what they what the executive, the executive team wants them to do. It'll be really different. So first of all, I need to bridge that gap and get buy-in. And also, are these, are these people ready to change? Do they want buy-in? Because why is it important? Why should we change a behaviour to align with that? How does that, how does that affect us? How, why is that important to me? So I think articulating and communicating what we're here for, what the outcome is, and what is high, what is high performance look like for you. Even in a low tier job, cooking chicken in McDonald's, well, high performance having the same product at the same time coming out consistently and, and, and meeting demand. So it doesn't matter what job you're doing, but you need a good role articulation and train and be really good at what you do. So I think focusing on the basics is the biggest thing. Executive team don't focus on the basics, they focus on the strategic, so it's really good. But then we need to bridge that with, hey, these are the basics. Are you there ready for the basics? Are you ready for change? So are you ready for change? What does change look like? What does performance look like for you? Are you trained for it? I think it's the biggest one.